Chapter 9 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Merced Ramblings. Delightful oaks cast protecting shadows over our camp on the 1st of June, 1866. Just beyond a little cook fire, where Hoover was preparing his mind and pan for an omelet, stood Mrs. Fremont's Mariposa cottage, with doors and windows wide open, still keeping up its air of hospitable invitation, though now deserted and fallen into decay. A little farther on, through an opening, a few clustered roofs and chimneys of the Bear Valley village showed their distant red-brown tint among heavy masses of green. Eastward swelled up a great ridge, upon whose grassy slopes were rough serpentine outcrops, groups of pines and oak groves with pale green foliage and clean white bark. Under the roots of this famous Mount Bullion had been mined those gold veins whose treasure enriched so few, whose promise allured so many. As I altogether distrust my ability to speak of this region without sooner or later alluding to a certain discovery of some scientific value which I once made here, I deem it wise, frankly, to tell the story and discharge my mind of it at once, and if possible forever. In the winter of 1863, I came to Bear Valley as the sole occupant of a stagecoach. The Sierras were quite cloud-hidden, and desolation, such as drought has never before or since been able to make, reigned in dreary monotony over all the plains from Stockton to Hornitas. Ordinarily, solitude is with me only a happy synonym for content, but throughout that ride I was preyed upon by self-reproach, and in an aggravated manner. The paleontologist of our survey my senior in rank and experience had just said of me, rather in sorrow than in unkindness, yet with unwanted severity, I believe that fellow had rather sit on a peak all day and stare at those snow mountains than find a fossil in the metamorphic Sierra. And in spite of me, all that weary ride his judgment rang in my ear. Can it be, I asked myself, has a student of geology so far forgotten his devotion to science? Am I really fallen to the level of a mere nature lover? Later, when evening approached, and our wheels began to rumble over upturned edges of Sierra Slate, every jolt seemed aimed at me, every thin, sharp outcrop appeared risen up to preach a sermon on my friend's text. I rededicated myself to geology, and was framing a resolution to delve for that greatly important but missing link of evidence, the fossil which should clear up an old unsolved riddle of upheaval age, when over to eastward a fervid crimson light smote the vapor bank and cleared a bright pathway through to the peaks and on to a pale sea-green sky. Through this gateway of rolling, gold, and red cloud, the summit seemed infinitely high and far, their stone and snow hung in the sky with lucent delicacy of hue, brilliant as gems yet soft as air, a mosaic of amethyst and opal transfigured with passionate light, as gloriously above words as beyond art. Obsolete shellfishes in the metamorphic were promptly forgotten, and during those lingering moments, while peak after peak flushed and faded back into recesses of the heavens, I forgot what paleontological unworthiness was loading me down, becoming finally quite jolly of heart. But for many days thereafter, I did surge in hope, leaving no stone unturned, and usually going so far as to break them open. Indeed, my third hammer and I were losing temper together, when one noon I was tired and sat down to rest and lunch in the bottom of Hell's Hollow, a canyon whose profound uninterestingness is quite beyond portrayal. Shut in by great monotonous slopes and innumerable spurs, 
each the exact facsimile of the other, with no distance, no faintest suggestion of a snow peak, only a lofty chaparral ridge sweeping around, cutting off all eastern lookout, with a few disordered boulders tumbled pell-mell into the bed of a feeble brooklet of bitter water, it seemed to me the place of places for a fossil. Here was Nader, the snow-capped zenith of my heart, banished even from sight. A swallow of tepid alkaline water, with which I crowned the frugal and appropriate lunch, burned my throat and completed the misery of the occasion. Jagged outcrops of slate cut through vulgar gold dirt at my feet. Picking up my hammer to turn homeward, I noticed in the rock an object about the size and shape of a small cigar. It was the fossil, the object for which science had searched and yearned and despaired. There he reclined comfortably upon his side, half bedded in luxuriously fine-grained agrilaceous material, a plump, pampered cephalopoda, if it is cephalopoda, whom the terrible ordeal of metamorphism had spared. I knelt and observed the radiating structure, as well as the characteristic central cavity, and assured myself it was beyond doubt he, the age of the gold belt, was discovered. I was at pains to chip my victim out whole, and when he chose to break in two, was easily consoled, reflecting that he would do as well gum together. I knew this mollusk perfectly by sight, could remember how he looked on half a dozen plates of fossils, but I failed exactly to recollect his name. It troubled me that I could come so near uttering without ever precisely hitting upon it. In ten or fifteen minutes I judged it full time for my joy to begin. Down the perspective of years, I could see before me spectacled wise men of some scientific society, and one who pronounced my obituary ending thus, in summing up the character and labors of this fallen follower of science, let it never be forgotten that he discovered the cephalopoda, and perhaps, I mused, they will put over me a slab of fossil raindrops, those eternally embalmed tears of nature. But all this came and went without the longed-for elation. There was no doubt I was not so happy as I thought I should be. Once, in after years, I met an aged German paleontologist, fresh from his fatherland, where through threescore years and ten his soul had fattened on Solenhofen limestone and effete shells from many and widespread strata. We were introduced. Ah, he said with the kindle of enthusiasm, I have pleasure you to meet when it is you which the cephalopoda discovered has. Then turning to one who enacted the part of Ganymede, he remarked, Zwei Lager. Now with freed mind, I should say something of the foothills about our camp as they looked in June. Once before, the reader may remember, I pictured their autumn garb. It has become a fixed habit with me to climb Mount Bullion whenever I get a chance. My winter Sundays were many times spent there in a peace and repose which Bear Valley Village did not afford, for that hamlet gave itself up, after the Saturday night's sleep, to a day of hellish jocularity. The town passed through a period of horse racing, noisy, quarrelsome drinking, and disorderly service of Satan, then an hour in which the Spaniard loved and treated the Americano, later the Americano kicked the damn greaser out of town, manly forms slept serenely under steps, and the few gentlemen of the old school steadied themselves against the barroom doorposts, and in ingenious language told of the good old pandemonium of 1849. Thus Mount Bullion came to mean for me a Sabbath retreat over which heaven arched pure and blue, silent hours marked by the slow sun, 
passing sacredly by in presence of nature and of God. So now in June, I climbed on a Sunday morning to my old retreat and found the same stone seat with leaning oak tree back and wide low canopy of boughs, a little down to the left, welling among tufts of grass and waving tulips, is the spring which Mrs. Fremont found for her campground. North and south for miles extends our ridge in gently rising or falling outline, its top broadly round, and for the most part an open oak grove with grass carpet and mountain flowers in wayward loveliness of growth. West, you overlook a wide panorama, oak and pine mottled foothills with rusty groundwork and cloudlings of green wander down in rolling lines to the right plain. Beyond are plains, then coast ranges, rising in peaks or curved down in passes, through which gray banks of fog drift in and vanish before the hot air of the plains. East, the Sierra slope is rent and gashed in a wilderness of canyons, yawning deep and savage. Miles of chaparral tangle in dense growth over the walls and spurs, covering with kindly olive green the staring red of riven mountainside and gashed earth. Beyond this swells up the more refined plateau and hill country, made of granite and trimmed with pine, bold domes rising above the green cover, and there the sharp, terrible front of El Capitan, guarding Yosemite and looking down into its purple gulf. Beyond, again, are the peaks, and among them one looms sharpest. It is that obelisk from which the great storm drove Cotter and me in 1864. We were now bound to push there as soon as grass should grow among the upper canyons. The air around my Sunday mountain in June is dry, bland, and fragrant. A full sunlight ripens it to a perfect temperature, giving you at once stimulus and rest. You sleep in it without fear of dew, and no excess of hot or cold breaks up the even flow of balmy delight. You see the wild tulips open and watch wind ripples course over slopes of thick-standing grass blades. Birds, so rare on plains or pine hills, here sing you their fullest and enjoy with you the soft white light or come to see you in your chosen shadow and bathe in your spring. Mountain oaks, less wonderful than great straight pines, but altogether domestic in their generous way of reaching out low, long boughs, roofing in spots of shade, are the only trees on the Pacific slope which seem to me at all allied to men. And these quiet foothill summits, these islands of modest, lovely verdure, floating in an ocean of sunlight, lifted enough above San Joaquin Plains to reach pure high air and thrill your blood and brain with mountain oxygen, are yet far enough below the rugged wildness of pine and ice and rock to leave you in peace and not forever challenge you to combat. They are almost the only places in the Sierras impressing me as rightly fitted for human company. I cannot find in wholesale vineyards and ranches dotted along the Sierra foot anything which savors of the eternal indigenous perfume of home. They are scenes of speculation and thrift, of immense enterprise and comfort, with no end of fences and square miles of grain, with here and there astounding specimens of modern upholstery, to say nothing of pianos with elaborate legs and always discordant keys, but they never comfort the soul with that air of sacred household reserve, of simple human poetry, which elsewhere greets you under plainer roofs and broods over your days and nights familiarly. Here on these still summits, the oaks lock their arms and gather in groves around open slopes of natural park, and you are at home. A cottage or castle would seem in keeping, 
nor would the savage gorges and snow-capped sierras overcome the sober kindliness of these affectionate trees. It is almost as hard now, as I write, to turn my back on Mount Bullion and descend to camp again, as it was that afternoon in 1866. Evening and supper were at hand, Hoover having achieved a repast of rabbit pie with salad from the Italian garden near at hand. It added no little to my peace that two obese squaws from the neighboring rancheria had come and squatted in silence on either side of our campfire, adding their statuesque sobriety and fire-flushed bronze to the dusky druidical scene. To be welcomed at White and Hatches next evening was reward for our dusty ride, and over the next day's familiar trail we hurried to Clark's, there again finding friends who took us by the hand. Another day's end found us within the Yosemite, and there for a week we walked and rode, studied and looked, revisiting all our old points, lingering hours here, half days there, to complete within our minds the conception of this place. My chief has written so fully in his charming Yosemite book of all main facts and details that I would not, if I could, rehearse them here. What sentiment, what idea, does this wonder valley leave upon the earnest observer? What impression does it leave upon his heart? From some upsurging crag upon its brink, you look out over wide expanse of granite swells, upon whose solid surface the firs climb and cluster, and afar on the skyline only darken together in one deep green cover. Upward heave the eastern ridges, above them looms a white rank of peaks. Into this plateau is rent a chasm. The fresh splintered granite falls down, down, thousands of feet in sheer blank faces or giant crags broken in cleft and stair, gorge and bluff, down till they sink under that winding ribbon of park with its flash of river, among sunlit grass, its darkness, where within shadows of jutting wall cloud-like gather the pine companies, or in summer opening, stand oak and cottonwood, casting together their lengthening shadow over meadow and pool. The falls, like torrents of snow, pour in white lines over purpled precipice, or as the wind wills, float and drift in vanishing film of airy lacework. Two leading ideas are wrought here with a force hardly to be seen elsewhere. First, the titanic power, the awful stress, which has rent this solid tableland of granite in twain. Secondly, the magical faculty displayed by vegetation in redeeming the aspect of wreck and masking a vast geological tragedy behind draperies of fresh and living green. I can never cease marveling how all this terrible crush and sundering is made fair, even lovely, by meadow, by wandering groves, and by those climbing files of pine which thread every gorge and camp in armies over every brink, nor can I ever banish from memory another gorge and fall, that of the Shoshone in Idaho, a sketch of which may help the reader to see more vividly those peculiarities of color and sentiment that make Yosemite so unique. The snake, or Lewis's fork, of the Columbia River drains an oval basin, the extent of whose longer axis measures about 400 miles westward from the base of the Rocky Mountains across Idaho and into the middle of Oregon, and whose breadth, in the direction of the meridian, averages about 70 miles. Irregular chains of mountains bound it in every direction, piling up in a few places to an elevation of 9,000 feet. The surface of this basin is unbroken by any considerable peak. Here and there, knobs, 
belonging to the earlier geological formations, rise above its level, and in a few instances, dome-like mounds of volcanic rock are lifted from the expanse. It has an inclination from east to west and a quite perceptible sag along the middle line. In general outline, the geology of the region is simple. Its bounding ranges were chiefly blocked out at the period of Jurassic upheaval when the Sierra Nevada and Wasatch Mountains were folded. Masses of upheaved granite, with overlying slates and limestones, form the main materials of the cordon of surrounding hills. During the Cretaceous and Tertiary periods, the entire basin, from the Rocky Mountains to the Blue Mountains of Oregon, was a freshwater lake on whose bottom was deposited a curious succession of sand and clay beds, including, near the surface, a layer of white infusorial silica. At the exposures of these rocks in the canyon walls of the present drainage system are found ample evidences of the kind of life which flourished in the lake itself and lived upon its borders. Savage fishes of the garpike type and vast numbers of cyprinoids, together with mollusks, are among the prominent water fossils. Enough relics of the land vegetation remain to indicate a flora of a subtropical climate, and among the land fossils are numerous bones of elephant, camel, horse, elk, and deer. The savant to whose tender mercies these disjecta membra have been committed finds in the molluscan life the most recent types yet discovered in the American tertiaries, forms closely allied to existing Asiatic species. How and wherefore this lake dried up and gave place to the present barren wilderness of sand and sage is one of those profound conundrums of nature, yet unguessed by geologists. From being a wide and beautiful expanse of water edged by winding mountain shores, with forest-clad slopes containing a fauna, whose remains are now charming in those light-minded fellows, the paleontologists, the scene has entirely changed, and a monotonous blank desert spreads itself as far as the eye can reach. Only here and there, near the snowy mountain tops, a bit of cool green contrasts refreshingly with the sterile uniformity of the plain. During the period of desiccation, perhaps in a measure accounting for it, a general flood of lava poured down from the mountains and deluged nearly the whole Snake Basin. The chief sources of this lava lay at the eastern edge, where subsequent erosion has failed to level several commanding groups of volcanic peaks. The three buttes and three tetons mark centers of flow. Remarkable features of the volcanic period were the sheets of basaltic lava which closed the eruptive era and in thin, continuous layers overspread the plain for 300 miles. The earlier flows extended farthest to the west. The ragged, broken terminations of the later sheets recede successively eastward in a broad, gradual stairway, so that the present topography of the basin is in a gently inclined field of basaltic lava sinking to the west, and finally, by a series of terrace steps, descending to the level of lacustrine sand rocks, which mark the bottom of the ancient lake and cover the plain westward into Oregon. The headwaters of the Snake River, gathering snow drainage from a considerable portion of the Rocky Mountains, find their way through a series of upland valleys to the eastern margin of the Snake Plain, and there gathering in one main stream flow westward, occupying a gradually deepening canyon, a narrow, dark gorge, water-worn through the thin sheets of basalt, cutting down as it proceeds to the westward until, in longitude 114 degrees 20 minutes, it is worn 700 feet into the lava. Several tributaries flowing through similar, though less profound, canyons 
join the snake both north and south. From the days of Lewis, for whom this snake or Shoshone River was originally named, up to the present day, rumors have been current of cataracts in the Snake Canyon. It is curious to observe that all the earlier accounts estimate their height as 600 feet, which is exactly the figure given by the first Jesuit observers of Niagara. That erratic amateur Indian, Catlin, actually visited these falls, and his account of them, while it entirely fails to give an adequate idea of their formation and grandeur, is nevertheless in the main truthful. Since the mining development of Idaho, several parties have visited and examined the Shoshone. In October 1868, with a small detachment of the United States Geological Survey of the 40th parallel, the writer crossed Goose Creek Mountains in northern Utah and descended by the old Fort Boise Road to the level of the Snake Plain. A gray, opaque haze hung close to the ground and shut out all distance. The monotony of sage desert was overpowering. We would have given anything for a good outlook, but for three days the mists continued and we were forced to amuse ourselves by chasing occasional antelopes. The evening we camped on Rock Creek was signalized by a fierce wind from the northeast. It was a dry storm, which continued with tremendous fury through the night, dying away at daybreak, leaving the heavens brilliantly clear. We were breakfasting when the sun rose, and shortly afterward, mounting into the saddle, headed toward the canyon of the Shoshone. The air was cold and clear. The remotest mountain peaks upon the horizon could be distinctly seen, and the forlorn details of their brown slopes stared at us as through a vacuum. A few miles in front, the smooth surface of the plain was broken by a ragged, zigzag line of black, which marked the edge of the further wall of the Snake Canyon. A dull, throbbing sound greeted us. Its pulsations were deep and seemed to proceed from the ground beneath our feet. Leaving the cavalry to bring up the wagon, my two friends and I galloped on and were quickly upon the edge of the canyon wall. We looked down into a broad, circular excavation three-quarters of a mile in diameter and nearly 700 feet deep. East and north, over the edges of the canyon, we looked across miles and miles of the Snake Plain, far on to the Blue Boundary Mountains. The wall of the gorge opposite us, like the cliff at our feet, sank in perpendicular bluffs nearly to the level of the river, the broad excavation being covered by rough piles of black lava and rounded domes of tracheite rock. A horizon as level as the sea, a circling wall, whose sharp edges were here and there battlemented in huge, fortress-like masses. A broad river, smooth and unruffled, flowing quietly into the middle of the scene and then plunging into a labyrinth of rocks, tumbling over a precipice 200 feet high and moving westward in a still, deep current to disappear behind a black promontory. It is a strange, savage scene, a monotony of pale blue sky, olive and gray stretches of desert, frowning walls of jetty lava, deep barrel green of river stretches, reflecting, here and there, the intense solemnity of the cliffs, and in the center a dazzling sheet of foam. In the early morning light, the shadows of the cliffs were cast over half the basin, defining themselves in sharp outline here and there on the river. Upon the foam of the cataract, one point of the rock cast a cobalt blue shadow. Where the river flowed around the western promontory, it was wholly in shadow and of a deep sea green. A scanty growth of coniferous trees fringed the brink of the lower cliffs overhanging the river. Dead barrenness 
is the whole sentiment of the scene. The mere suggestion of trees clinging here and there along the walls serves rather to heighten than to relieve the forbidding gloom of the place, nor does the flashing whiteness, where the river tears itself among the rocky islands or rolls in spray down the cliff, brighten the aspect. In contrast with its brilliancy, the rocks seem darker and more wild. The descent of 400 feet from our standpoint to the level of the river above the falls has to be made by a narrow, winding path among rough ledges of lava. We were obliged to leave our wagon at the summit and pack down the camp equipment and photographic apparatus upon carefully led mules. By midday, we were comfortably camped on the margin of the left bank, just above the brink of the falls. My tent was pitched upon the edge of a cliff directly overhanging the rapids. From my door, I looked over the cataract and, whenever the veil of mist was blown aside, could see for a mile down the river. The lower half of the canyon is excavated in a gray porphyritic tracheite, it is over this material that the snake falls. Above the brink, the whole breadth of the river is broken by a dozen small tracheite islands, which the water has carved into fantastic forms, rounding some into low domes, sharpening others into mere pillars, and now and then wearing out deep caves. At the very brink of the fall, a few twisted evergreens cling with their roots to the rock and lean over the abyss of foam with something of that air of fatal fascination which is apt to take possession of men. In plan, the fall recurves upstream in a deep horseshoe resembling the outline of Niagara. The total breadth is about 700 feet and the greatest height of the single fall about 190. Among the islands above the brink are several beautiful cascades where portions of the river pour over in lace-like forms. The whole mass of cataract is one ever-varying sheet of spray. In the early spring, when swollen by the rapidly melted snows, the river pours over with something like the grand volume of Niagara, but at the time of my visit, it was wholly white foam. Here and there, along the brink, the underlying rock shows through, and among the islands, shallow green pools disclose the form of the underlying tracheite. Numberless rough shelves break the fall, but the volume is so great that they are only discovered by the glancing outward of the foam. The river below the falls is very deep. The right bank sinks into the water in a clear, sharp precipice, but on the left side a narrow, pebbly beach extends along the foot of the cliff. From the top of the wall, at a point a quarter of a mile below the falls, a stream has gradually worn a little stairway. Thick growths of evergreens have huddled together in this ravine. By careful climbing, we descended to the level of the river, the tracheites are very curiously worn in vertical forms, here and there an obelisk, either wholly or half detached from the canyon wall, juts out like a buttress. Farther down, these projecting masses stand like a row of columns upon the left bank. Above them, a solid capping of black lava reaches out to the edge and overhangs the river in abrupt black precipices. Wherever large fields of basalt have overflowed an earlier rock and erosion has afterward laid it bare, there is found a strong tendency to fracture in vertical lines. The immense expansion of the upper surface from heat seems to cause deep fissures in the mass. Under the influence of the cool shadow of cliffs and pine and constant percolating of surface waters, a rare fertility is developed in the ravines opening upon the canyon shore. 
a luxuriance of ferns and mosses, an almost tropical wealth of green leaves and velvety carpeting line the banks. There are no rocks at the base of the fall. The sheet of foam plunges almost vertically into a dark, barrel-green, lake-like expanse of the river. Immense volumes of foam roll up from the cataract base and, whirling about in the eddying winds, rise often a thousand feet in the air. When the wind blows down the canyon, a gray mist obscures the river for half a mile, and when, as is usually the case in the afternoon, the breezes blow eastward, the foam curls over the brink of the fall and hangs like a veil over the upper river. On what conditions depends the height to which the foam cloud rises from the base of the fall, it is apparently impossible to determine. Without the slightest wind, the cloud of spray often rises several hundred feet above the canyon wall, and again, with apparently the same conditions of river and atmosphere, it hardly reaches the brink. Incessant roar, reinforced by a thousand echoes, fills the canyon. Out of this monotone, from time to time, rise strange, wild sounds, and now and then may be heard a slow, measured beat, not unlike the recurring fall of breakers. From the white front of the cataract, the eye constantly wanders up to the black, frowning parapet of lava. Angular bastions rise sharply from the general level of the wall, and here and there isolated blocks, profiling upon their skyline, strikingly recall barbette batteries. To goad one imagination up to the point of perpetually seeing resemblances of everything else in the forms of rocks, it is the most vulgar vice of travelers. To refuse to see the architectural suggestions upon the Snake Canyon, however, is to administer a flat snub to one's fancy. The whole edge of the canyon is deeply cleft in vertical crevasses. The actual brink is usually formed of irregular blocks and prisms of lava, poised upon their ends in an unstable equilibrium ready to be tumbled over at the first leverage of the frost. Hardly an hour passes without the sudden boom of one of these rock masses falling upon the ragged debris piles below. Night is the true time to appreciate the full force of the scene. I lay and watched it many hours. The broken rim of the basin profiled itself upon a mass of drifting clouds where torn openings revealed gleams of pale moonlight and bits of remote sky trembling with misty stars. Intervals of light and blank darkness hurriedly followed each other. For a moment, the black gorge would be crowded with forms, tall cliffs, ramparts of lava, the rugged outlines of islands huddled together on the cataract's brink, faintly luminous foam breaking over black rapids, the swift white leap of the river, and a ghostly formless mist through which the canyon walls and far reach of the lower river were veiled and unveiled again and again. A moment of this strange picture, and then a rush of black shadow, when nothing could be seen but the breaks in the clouds, the basin rim, and a vague white center in the general darkness. After sleeping on the nightmarish brink of the falls, it was no small satisfaction to climb out of this Dantean gulf and find myself once more upon a pleasantly prosaic foreground of sage. Nothing more effectively banishes a mellow tragic state of the mind than the obtrusive ugliness and abominable smell of this plant. From my feet, a hundred miles of it stretched eastward. A half hour's walk took me out of sight of the canyon, and as the wind blew westward, only occasional indistinct pulsations of the fall could be heard. The sky was bright and cloudless, an arched in cheerful vacancy over the meaningless disk of the desert. I walked for an hour, 
following an old Indian trail which occasionally approached within seeing distance of the river, and then apparently quite satisfied, diverged again into the desert. When about four miles from the Shoshone, it bent abruptly to the north and led to the canyon edge. Here again the narrow gorge widened into a broad theater, surrounded as before by black vertical walls, and crowded over its whole surface by rude piles and ridges of volcanic rock. The river entered it from the east through a magnificent gateway of basalt, and, having reached the middle, flowed on either side of a low rocky island and plunges in two falls into a deep green basin. A very singular ridge of the basalt projects like an arm almost across the river, enclosing within its semicircle a bowl 300 feet in diameter and 200 feet deep. Within this, the water was of the same peculiar barrel green, dappled here and there by masses of foam which swim around and around with a spiral tendency toward the center. To the left of the island, half the river plunges off an overhanging lip and falls about 150 feet, the whole volume reaching the surface of the basin many feet from the wall. The other half has worn away the edge and descends in a tumbling cascade at an angle of about 45 degrees. The river at this point has not yet worn through the fields of basaltic lava, which formed the upper 400 feet of the plain. Between the two falls, it cuts through the remaining beds of basalt and has eroded its channel a hundred feet into underlying porphyritic tracheite. The tracheite erodes far more easily than the basalt, and its resultant forms are quite unlike those of the black lava. The tracheite islands and walls are excavated here and there in deep caves, leaving island masses in the forms of mounds and towers. In general, spherical outlines predominate, while the erosion of the basalt results always in sharp, perpendicular cliffs with a steeply inclined talus of ragged debris. The cliffs around the upper cataract are inferior to those of the Shoshone. While the level of the upper plain remains nearly the same, the river constantly deepens the channel in its westward course. In returning from the upper fall, I attempted to climb along the very edge of the cliff in order to study carefully the habits of the basalt, but I found myself in a labyrinth of side crevices which were cut into the plain from a hundred to a thousand feet back from the main wall. These recesses were usually in the form of an amphitheater with black walls two hundred feet high and a bottom filled with immense fragments of basalt rudely piled together. By dint of hard climbing, I reached the actual brink in a few places and saw the same general features each time. The canyon successively widening and narrowing, its walls here and there approaching each other and standing like pillars of a gateway, the river alternately flowing along smooth, placid reaches of level and rushing swiftly down rocky cascades. Here and there along the cliff, are disclosed mouths of black caverns, where the lava seems to have been blown up in the form of a great blister, as if the original flow had poured over some pool of water and, converted into steam by contact with the hot rock, had been blown up bubble-like by its immense expansion. I continued my excursions along the canyon west of the Shoshone. About a mile below the fall, a very fine promontory juts sharply out and projects nearly to the middle of the canyon. Climbing with difficulty along its toppling crest, I reached a point which I found composed of immense angular fragments piled up in dangerous poise. Eastward, the battlemented rocks around the falls limited the view, but westward I could see down long reaches of river where islands of tracheite rose above white cascades. A peculiar and fine effect is noticeable upon the river during all the midday. The shadow of the southern cliff 
is cast down here and there, completely darkening the river, but often defining itself upon the water. The contrast between the rich, gem-like green of the sunlit portions and the deep violet shadow of the cliff is of extreme beauty. The Snake River, deriving its volume wholly from the melting of the mountain snows, is a direct gauge of the annual advance of the sun. In June and July, it is a tremendous torrent carrying a full half of the Columbia. From the middle of July, it constantly shrinks, reaching its minimum in midwinter. At the lowest, it is a river equal to the Sacramento or Connecticut. After ten days devoted to walking around the neighborhood and studying the falls and rocks, we climbed to our wagon and rested for a farewell look at the gorge. It was with great relief that we breathed the free air of the plain and turned from the rocky canyon where darkness and roar and perpetual cliffs had bounded our senses and headed southward across the noiseless plain. Far ahead rose a lofty blue barrier, a mountain wall marbled upon its summit by flecks of perpetual snow. A deep notch in its profile opened a gateway. Toward this, for leagues ahead of us, a white thread in the gray desert marked the winding of our road. Those sensitively organized creatures, the mules, thrilled with relief at their escape from the canyons, pressed forward with a vigor that utterly silenced the customary poppings of the whip and expurgated the language of the driver from his usual breaking of the third commandment. The three great falls of America, Niagara, Shoshone, and Yosemite, all happily bearing Indian names, are as characteristically different as possible. There seems little left for a cataract to express. Niagara rolls forward with something like the inexorable sway of a natural law. It is force, power, forever banishing before its irresistible rush all ideas of restraint. No sheltering pine or mountain distance of up-piled Sierras guards the approach to the Shoshone. You ride upon a waste, the pale earth stretched in desolation, suddenly you stand upon a brink, as if the earth had yawned. Black walls flank the abyss. Deep in the bed, a great river fights its way through labyrinths of blackened ruins, and plunges in foaming whiteness over a cliff of lava. You turn from the brink as from a frightful glimpse of the inferno, and when you've gone a mile, the earth seems to have closed again. Every trace of canyon has vanished, and the stillness of the desert reigns. As you stand at the base of those cool walls of granite that rise to the clouds from the green floor of Yosemite, a beautiful park carpeted with verdure, expands from your feet, vast and stately pines band with their shadows, the sunny reaches of the Pura Merced. An arch of blue bridges over from cliff to cliff. From the far summit of a wall, a pearly granite, over stains of purple and yellow, leaping as it were from the very cloud, falls a silver scarf, light, lace-like, graceful, luminous, swayed by the wind. The cliff's repose is undisturbed by the silvery fall, whose endlessly varying forms of wind-tossed spray lend an element of life to what would otherwise be masses of inanimate stone. The Yosemite is a grace. It is an adornment. It is a ray of light on the solid front of the precipice. From Yosemite, our course was bent toward the Merced Obelisk. An afternoon in early July brought us to camp in the selfsame spot where Cotter and I had bivouacked in the storm more than two years before. I remembered the crash and wail of those two dreary nights, the thunderous fullness of tempest beating upon cliffs and the stealthy, silent snow burial. And perhaps to the memory of that bitter experience, 
was added the contrasting force of today's beauty. A warm afternoon sun poured through cloudless skies into one rocky amphitheater. The little alpine meadow and full arrowy brook were flanked upon either side by broad rounded masses of granite and margined by groups of vigorous upland trees, firs for the most part, but watched over here and there by towering pines and great aged junipers whose massive red trunks seemed welded to the very stone. It was altogether exhilarating. Even little Billy, the gray horse, found it so, and devoted more time to practical jokes upon thick-headed mules than to the rich and tempting verdure. Nor did the high, cool air banish from his tender heart a glowing platonic affection for our brown mare, Sally. To the ripened charms of middle age, Sally united something more than the memory of youth, she was remarkably plump and well-preserved, her figure firm and elastic, and she did not hesitate to display it with many little arts. In presence of her favored Billy, she drew deep sighs and had quite an irresistible fashion of turning sadly aside and moving away among trees alone, as if she had no one to love her, a while never failing to bring him to her side and elicit such attention as smoothing her mane or even a pressure of lips upon her brow. And woe to the emotional mule who ventured to cross our little meadow just to feel for a moment the soft comfort of her presence. With the bitterness of a rejected suit, he always bore away shoe prints of jealous Billy. He led her quietly down to the brook and never drank a drop until the mare was done. Then they paid a call at camp, nosing about among kettles with familiar freedom, nibbling playfully at dish towel and coffee pot, and when we threw sticks at them, trotted off as closely as if they'd been harnessed together. In quiet moonlit hours before I went to bed, I saw them still side by side, her head leaning over his withers, Billy at Quivive, staring dramatically with pointed ears into forest depths, a true and watchful guardian. A little reconnoitering had shown us the most direct way to the obelisk, whose sharp summit looked from the moraine to west of us as grand and alluring as we had ever thought it. There was in our hope of scaling this point something more than mere desire to master a difficult peak. It was a station of great topographical value, the apex of many triangles, and, more than all, would command a grander view of the Merced region than any other summit. July 11th, about 5 p.m., Gardner and I strapped packs upon our shoulders. My friend's load consisted of the temple transit, his blanket, and a great tin cup. Mine was made up of field glass, compass, level, blanket, and provisions for both, besides the barometer which, as usual, I slung over one shoulder. For the first time that year we found ourselves slowly zigzagging to and fro, following a grade with that peculiarly deliberate gait to which mountaineering experience very soon confines one. Black firs and thick clustered pines covered in clumps all the lower slope, but ascending, we came more and more into open ground, walking on glacial debris among trains of huge boulders and occasional thickets of slender, delicate young trees. Emerging finally into open granite country, we came full in sight of our goal, whose great western precipice rose sheer and solid above us. From the south base of the obelisk, a sharp mural ridge curves east, surrounding an amphitheater whose sloping rugged sides were picturesquely modeled in snow and stone. From the summit of this ridge, we knew we should look over into the upper Merced Basin, a great billowy granite depression lying between the Merced Group and Mount Lyell, the birthplace of all those ice rivers and deep canyon torrents which join in the Little Yosemite and form the River Merced. 
Toward this we pressed, hurrying rapidly as the sun declined, in hopes of making our point before darkness should obscure the terra incognita beyond. It put us at our best to hasten over the rough, rudely piled blocks and up cracks among solid bluffs of granite, but with the sun fully half an hour high, we reached the obelisk foot and looked from our ridge top eastward into the new land. From our feet, granite and ice and steep, roof-like curves fell abruptly down to the Merced Canyon brink, and beyond, over the great gulf, rose terraces and ridges of sculptured stone, dressed with snowfield, one above another, up to the eastern rank of peaks, whose sharp, solid forms were still in full light. From below, it is always a most interesting feature of the mountaineer's daily life to watch fading sunlight upon the summit rocks and snow. There is something peculiarly charming in the deep carmine flush and in the pale gradations of violet and cool blue-purple into which it successively fades. We were now in the very midst of this alpine glow. A rocky amphitheater opening directly into the sun was crowded full of this pure red light, snowfields warm to deepest rose, gnarled stems of dead pines were dark vermilion, the rocks yellow, and the vast body of the obelisk at our left one spire of gold, piercing the sapphire zenith. Eastward, far below us, the Illouette Basin lay in a particularly mild haze, its deep carpet of forest warmed into faint bronze, and the bare domes and rounded granite bridges which everywhere rise above the trees were yellow of a soft creamy tint. Farther down, every foothill was perceptibly reddened under the level beams. Sunlight reflecting from every object shot up to us, enriching the brightness of our amphitheater. We drank and breathed the light, its mellow warmth permeating every fiber. We spread our blankets under the lee of an overhanging rock, sheltered from the keen east wind, and in full view of the broad western horizon. After a short half hour of this wonderful light, the sun rested for an instant upon the coast ranges and sank, leaving our mountains suddenly dead, as if the very breath of life had ebbed away. Cold gray shadows covering their rigid bodies and pale sheets of snow half shrouding their forms. For a full hour after the sun went down, we did little else than study the western sky, watching with greatest interest a wonderful permanence and singular gradation of lingering light. Over 200 miles of horizon, a low stratum of pure orange covered the sky for seven or eight degrees. Above that, another narrow band of beryl green and then the cool, dark evening blue. I always notice, whenever one gets a very wide view of remote horizon from some lofty mountain top, the sky loses its high-domed appearance, the gradations reaching but a few degrees upward from the earth, creating the general form of an inverted saucer. The orange and barrel bands occupied only about 15 degrees in altitude but swept around nearly from north to south. It was as if a wonderfully transparent and brilliant rainbow had been stretched along the skyline. At eleven, the colors were still perceptible, and at midnight, when I rose to observe the thermometer, they were gone, but a low, faint zone of light still lingered. At gray dawn, we were up and cooking our rasher of bacon, and soon had shouldered our instruments and started for the top. The obelisk is flattened and expands its base into two sharp serrated ridges which form its north and south edges. The broad faces turned to the east and west are solid and utterly inaccessible, the latter being almost vertical, the former quite too steep to climb. 
we started, therefore, to work our way up the south edge, and having crossed a little ravine from whose head we could look down eastward upon steep thousand-foot neve, and on the western, along the forest-covered ridge, up which we had clambered, began in good earnest to mount rough blocks of granite. The edge here is made of immense broken rocks, poised on each other in delicate balance, vast masses threatening to topple over at a touch. This blade has from a distance a considerably smooth and even appearance, but we found it composed of pinnacles often a hundred feet high, separated from the main top by a deep vertical cleft. More than once, after struggling to the top of one of these pinnacles, we are obliged to climb down the same way in order to avoid the notches. Finally, when we had reached the brink of a vertical cul-de-sac, the edge no longer afforded us even a foothold. There were left but the smooth, impossible western face and the treacherous cracked front of the eastern precipice. We were driven out upon the ladder, and here forced to climb with the very greatest care, one of us always in advance, making sure of his foothold, the other passing up instruments by hand, and then cautiously following. In this way we spent nearly a full hour going from crack to crack, clinging by the least protruding masses of stone, now and then looking over our shoulders at the wreck of granite, the slopes of ice, and frozen lake thousands of feet below, and then upward to gather courage from the bold red spike which still rose grandly above us. At last we struggled up to what we had all along believed the summit, and found ourselves only on a minor turret, the great needle still a hundred feet above. From rock to rock and crevice to crevice we made our way up a fractured edge until within fifty feet of the top, and here its sharp angle rose smooth and vertical, the eastern precipice carved in a flat face upon the one side, the western broken by a smoothly curved recess like the corner of a room. No human being could scale the edge. An arctic bluebird fluttered among the eastern slope in vain quest of a foothold and alighted panting at our feet. One step more, and we stood together on a little detached pinnacle where, by steadying ourselves against the sharp vertical obelisk edge, we could rest, although the keen sense of steepness below was not altogether pleasing. About seven feet across the open head of a cul-de-sac, a mere recess in the west face, was a vertical crack riven into the granite not more than three feet wide, but as much as eight feet deep. In it were wedged a few loose boulders. Below it opened out into space. At the head of this crack, a rough crevice led up to the summit. Summoning nerve, I knew I could make the leap, but the life and death question was whether the debris would give way under my weight and leave me struggling in the smooth recess, sure to fall and be dashed to atoms. Two years we had longed to climb that peak, and now within a few yards of the summit, no weak-heartedness could stop us. I thought, should the debris give way, by a very quick turn and powerful spring, I could regain our rock in safety. There was no discussion, but, planting my foot on the brink, I sprang, my side brushing the rough, projecting crag. While in the air I looked down, and a picture stamped itself on my brain, never to be forgotten. The debris crumbled and moved. I clutched both sides of the cleft, relieving all possible weight from my feet. The rocks wedged themselves again, and I was safe. It was a delicate feat of balancing for us to bridge that chasm, with a transit and pass it across, the view it afforded down the abyss was calculated to make a man cool and steady. Barometer and knapsack were next passed over. I placed them all at the crevice head and flattened myself against the rock 
to make room for Gardner. I shall never forget the look in his eye as he caught a glimpse of the abbess in his leap. It gave me such a chill as no amount of danger nor even death coming to myself could ever give. The debris grated under his weight an instant and wedged themselves again. We sprang up on the rocks like chamois and stood on the top, shouting for joy. Our summit was four feet across, not large enough for the transit instrument and both of us, so I, whose duties were geological, descended to a niche a few feet lower and sat down to my writing. The sense of aerial isolation was thrilling. Away below, rocks, ridges, crags, and fields of ice swell up in jostling confusion to make a base from which springs the spire of stone 11,600 feet high. On all sides, I could look right down at the narrow pedestal. Eastward, great ranks of peaks culminating in Mount Lyell were in full clear view. All streams and canyons tributary to the Merced were beneath us in map-like distinctness. Afar to the west lay the rolling plateau, gashed with canyons, there the white line of Yosemite Fall, and beyond, half submerged in warm haze, my Sunday mountain. The same little arctic bluebird came again and perched close by me, pouring out his sweet simple song with a gaiety and freedom which wholly charmed me. During our four hours' stay, the thought that we must make that leap again gradually intruded itself, and, whether writing or studying the country, I could not altogether free myself from its pressure. It was a relief when we packed up and descended to the horrible cleft to actually meet our danger. We had now an unreliable footing to spring from, and a mere block of rock to balance us after the jump. We sprang strongly, struck firmly, and were safe. We worked patiently down the east face, wound among blocks and pinnacles of the lower descent, and hurried through moraines to camp, well pleased that the obelisk had not vanquished us. End of chapter 9 Merced Ramblings Chapter 10 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Cut Off Cobbles. One October day, as Kawea and I traveled by ourselves over a lonely foothill trail, I came to consider myself the friend of woodpeckers. With rather more reserve as regards the blue jay, let me admit great interest in his worldly wisdom. As an instance of cooperative living, the partnership of these two birds is rather more hopeful than most mundane experiments. For many autumn and winter months, such food as their dainty taste chooses is so rare throughout the Sierras that in default of any climatic temptation to migrate, the birds get in harvests with annual regularity and surprising labor. Oak and pine mingle in open growth. Acorns from the one are their grain. The soft pine bark is the granary, and this is the process. Armies of woodpeckers drill small round holes in the bark of standing pine trees, sometimes perforating it thickly, up to twenty or thirty and even forty feet above the ground, and then about equal numbers of woodpeckers and jays gather acorns, rejecting always the little cup, and insert the gland tightly in the pine bark, with its tender base outward and exposed to the air. A woodpecker, having drilled a hole, has its exact measure in mind, and after examining a number of acorns makes his selection, and never fails of a perfect fit. Not so the jolly, careless jay, who picks up any sound acorn he finds, and, if it's not too large for a hole, drops it in the most offhand way, 
as if it were an affair of no consequence, utters one of his dry, chuckling squawks, and either tries another or loafs about lazily watching the hard-working woodpeckers. Thus they live, amicably harvesting, and with this sequel, those acorns in which grubs form become the sole property of woodpeckers, while all sound ones fall to the jays. Ordinarily, chances are in favor of woodpeckers, and when they are absolutely no sound nuts, the jays sell short, so to speak, and go over to Nevada and speculate in juniper berries. The monotony of hill and glade failing to interest me, and in default of other diversion, I all day long watch the birds, recalling how many gay and successful jays I knew who lived as these on the wit and industry of less ostentatious woodpeckers, thinking, too, what naively dogmatic and richly worded political economy Mr. Ruskin would phrase from my feathered friends. Thus I came to Ruskin, wishing I might see the work of his idol, and after that longing for some equal artist who should arise and choose to paint our Sierras as they are, with all their color glory, power of innumerable pine and countless pinnacle, gloom of tempest or splendor, where rushing light shatters itself upon granite crag or burns in dying rose upon far fields of snow. <sighs> Had I rubbed Aladdin's lamp? A turn in the trail brought suddenly in view a man who sat under shadow of oaks, painting upon a large canvas. As I approached, the artist turned half round in his stool, rested palette and brushes upon one knee, and in familiar tone said, "'Durned if you ain't just naturally catch me at it. Get off and set down. You ain't going for no doctor, I know.' My artist was of short, good-natured, butcher-boy makeup, dressed in what had formerly been black broadcloth, with an enlivening show of red flannel shirt about the throat, wrists, and a considerable display of the same, where his waistcoat might have once overlapped a strained but as yet coherent waistband. The cut of these garments, by length of coat tail and voluminous leg, proudly asserted a bay origin. His small feet were squeezed into tight short boots with high raking heels. A round face with small full mouth, non-committal nose, and black protruding eyes showed no more sign of the ideal temperament than did the broad daub upon his square yard of canvas. Going to Copples? inquired my friend. That was my destination, I answered. Yes. That's me, he ejaculated, right over there, down below those two oaks. Ever there? No. My studio's there now, giving impressive accent to the word. All the while, as these few words were passing, he scrutinized me with unconcealed curiosity, puzzled, as well he might be, while I dress and equipment. Finally, after I had tied Kawea to a tree and seated myself by the easel, and after he had absently rubbed some raw sienna into his little store of white, he softly ventured, Was you out looking for a ditch? No, I replied. He neatly rubbed up the white and sienna with his blender, unconsciously adding a dash of Veronese green, gazed at my leggings, and then at the barometer, and again meeting my eye with a look as if he feared I might be a disguised duke, said in a slow tone, with hyphens of silence between each two syllables, giving to his language all the dignity of an unabridged Webster, I would take pleasure in stating that my name is Hank G. Smith, artist. And seeing me smile, he relaxed a little, and giving the blender another vigorous twist, added, I would request yours. Mr. Smith, having learned my name, occupation, and that my home was on the Hudson, near New York, 
quickly assumed a familiar me and you old fellow tone and rattled on merrily about his winter in new york spent in going through the academy a period of deep moment to one who before that painted only wagons for his livelihood storing away canvas stool and easel in a deserted cabin close by he rejoined me and leading kawea by his lariat I walked beside Smith down the trail toward Copples. He talked freely, and as if composing his own biography, beginning, California born and mountain raised, his nature soon drove him into a painter's career. Then he reverted fondly to New York and his experience there. Oh, no, he mused in pleasant irony. He never spread his napkin over his legs and partook French fiddles up to old Delmonico's. That wasn't H.G. which took her to the theater. In a sort of stage aside to me, he added, she was a model. Stood for them sculptors, you know, perfectly virtuous and built from the ground up. Then, as if words failed him, made an expressive gesture with both hands over his shirt bosom to indicate the topography of her figure and sliding them down sharply against his waistband he added anatomical torso mr smith found relief in meeting one so near himself as he conceived me to be in habit and experience the long pent-up emotions and ambitions of his life found ready utterance and a willing listener I learned that his aim was to become a characteristically California painter, with special designs for making himself famous as the delineator of mule trains and ox wagons, to be, as he expressed it, the Pacific Slope Bonheur. There, he said, is old Eastman Johnson. He's made the riffle on Barnes and that everlasting girl with the ears of corn, but it ain't life. It ain't got the real get-up. If you want to see the thing, just look at a Jerome. His Arab folks and Egyptian dancing girls, they ain't assuming a pleasant expression and looking at spots while their likeness is took. Mm, H.G. will discount Eastman yet. He avowed his great admiration of church, which, with a little leaning toward Mr. Gifford, seemed his only hearty approval. It's all Bierstadt, Bierstadt, and Bierstadt nowadays. What has he done but twist and skew and distort, discolor and belittle and be pretty this whole doggone country? Why, his mountains are too high and too slim. They'd blow over in one of our fall winds. I've herded colts two summers in Yosemite, and honest now, when I stood right up in front of his picture, I didn't know it. He hasn't what old Ruskin calls for. By this time the station buildings were in sight, and far down the canyon, winding in even grade around spur after spur, outlined by a low clinging cloud of red dust, we could see the great Sierra mule train, that industrial gulf stream flowing from California plains over into arid Nevada, carrying thither materials for life and luxury. In a vast perpetual caravan of heavy wagons, drawn by teams of from eight to fourteen mules, all the supplies of many cities and villages were hauled across the Sierra at an immense cost, and with such skill of driving and generalship of mules as the world has never seen before. Our trail descended toward the grade, quickly bringing us to a high bank immediately overlooking the trains a few rods below the group of station buildings. I had by this time learned that Copples, the former station proprietor, had suffered amputation of the leg three times, receiving from the roadmen, in consequence, the name of Cutoff, and that, while his doctors disagreed as to whether they better try a fourth, the kindly hand of death had spared him that pain, and Mrs. Copples an added extortion in the bill. The dying Cutoff had made his wife promise she would stay by and carry on the station until all his debts, which were many and heavy, should be paid, and then do as she chose. 
the poor woman, a New Englander of some refinement, lingered, sadly fulfilling her task, the longing for liberty. When Smith came to speak of Sarah Jane, her niece, a new light kindled in my friend's eye. You never saw Sarah Jane? he inquired. I shook my head. He went on to tell me that he was living in hope of making her Mrs. H.G., but that the barkeeper also indulged a hope, and as this important functionary was a man of ready cash and of Derringer's and few words, it became a delicate matter to avow open rivalry. But it was evident my friend's star was ascendant, and learning that he considered himself to possess the deadwood and to have gated the barkeeper, I was more than amused, even comforted. It was a pleasure to sit there, leaning against a vigorous old oak, while Smith opened his heart to me, in easy confidence and with quick eye watching the passing mules, penciled in a little sketchbook, a leg, a head, or such portions of body and harness as seemed to him useful for future works. These are notes, he said, and I've pretty much made up my mind to paint my great picture on a gee-pole. I'll scumble in a sunset effect, lighting up the dust, and striking across the backs of team and driver, and I'll paint a come up there, don't you look, on the old teamster's face, and the mules will be just a humping their little selves and laying down to work like they'd expire. And the wagon, don't you see what fine color material there is and the heavy load and the canvas top with sunlight and shadow in the folds? And that's what's the matter with H.G. Smith. Orders, sir, orders. That's what I'll get then. And I'll take my little old Sarah Jane and light out for New York, and you'll see Smith on a studio door plate, and folks will say, Fine feeling for nature has Smith. I let the singular man speak for himself in his own vernacular, pruning nothing of its idiom or slang, as you choose to call it. In this faithful transcript, there are words I could have wished to expunge, but they are his, not mine, and illustrate his mental construction. The breath of most Californians is as unconsciously charged with slang as an Italian's of garlic, and the two, after all, have much the same function. You touch the bowl, or your language, but should never let either be fairly recognized in salad or conversation. But Smith's English was the well undefiled when compared with what I every moment heard from the current of teamsters which set constantly by us in the direction of Copples. Close in front came a huge wagon piled high with cases of freight and drawn along by a team of twelve mules whose heavy breathing and drenched skins showed them hard work and well tired out. The driver looked anxiously ahead at a soft spot in the road, and on at the station, as if calculating hmm, whether his team had courage left to haul through. He called kindly to them, cracked his black snake whip, and all together they strained bravely on. The great van rocked settled in a little on the rear side, and stuck fast. With a look of despair, the driver got off and laid the lash freely among his team. They jumped and jerked, frantically tangled themselves up, and at last all sulked and became stubbornly immovable. Meanwhile, a mile of teams behind, unable to pass on the narrow grade, came to an unwilling halt. About five wagons back, I noticed a tall pike, dressed in checkered shirt and pantaloons tucked into jackboots. A soft felt hat, worn on the back of his head, displayed long locks of flaxen hair, which hung freely about a florid pink countenance, noticeable for its pair of violent little blue eyes and facial angle rendered acute by a sharp long nose. This fellow watched the stoppage with impatience, and at last, when it was more than he could bear, walked up by the other teams with a look of wrath absolutely devilish, 
one would have expected him to blow up with rage, yet withal his gait and manner were cool and soft in the extreme. In a bland, almost tender voice, he said to the unfortunate driver, My friend, perhaps I can help you. In his gentle way of disentangling and patting the leaders as he headed them round in the right direction, would have given him a high office under Mr. Berg. He leisurely examined the embedded wheel, cast an eye along the road ahead. He then began, in rather excited manner, to swear, pouring it out louder and more profane till he utterly eclipsed the most horrid blasphemies I ever heard, piling them up thicker and more fiendish till it seemed as if the very earth must open and engulf him. I noticed one mule after another give a little squat, bringing their breasts hard against the collars, and straining traces till only one old mule, with ears back and dangling chain, still held out. The pike walked up and yelled one gigantic oath. Her ears sprang forward. She squatted in terror, and the iron links grated under her strain. He then stepped back and took the rein, every trembling mule looking out of the corner of its eye and glistening at Quivive, with a peculiar air of deliberation and of childlike simplicity. He said in everyday tones, Come up there, mules. One quick strain, a slight rumble, and the wagon rolled on to Copples. Smith and I followed, and as we neared the house, he punched me familiarly and said, as a brown petticoat disappeared in the station door, ah, There's Sarah Jane. When I see that girl, I feel like I'd like to reach out and gather her in. Then clasping her imaginary form, as if she was about to dance with him, he executed a couple of waltz turns, softly intimating, and that's what's the matter with H.G. Kawea being stabled, we betook ourselves to the office, which was, of course, bar room as well. As I entered, the unfortunate teamster was about paying his liquid compliment to the florid pike. Their glasses were filled, my respects, said the little driver. The whiskey became lost to view and went eroding its way through the dust these poor fellows had swallowed. He added, Well, Billy, you can swear. Swear, repeated the pike in a tone of incredulous questioning. Me swear? As if the compliment were greater than his modest desert. No. I can't blaspheme worth a cuss. You just ought to hear Pete Green. He can exhort the impenitent mule. I've known a ten-mule team to renounce the flesh and haul 31,000 through a foot of clay mud under one of his outpourings. As a hotel, Cobbles is on the Mongolian plan, which means that dining room and kitchen are given over to the mercies, never very tender, of Chinamen. Not such Chinamen as learned the art of pig roasting that they might be served up by Aaliyah, but the average John, and a sadly low average that John is. I grant him a certain general air of thrift, admitting, too, that his lack of sobriety never makes itself apparent in loud Celtic brawl. But he is, when all is said, and in spite of timid and fawning obedience, a very poor servant. Now and then at one friend's house, it has happened to me that I dined upon artistic Chinese cookery, and all they who come home from living in China smack their lips over the relishing cuisine. I wish they had sat down that day at Copple's. No, on second thought, I would spare them. John may go peacefully to North Adams and make shoes for us, but I shall not solve the awful domestic problem by bringing him into my kitchen. Certainly so as long as Howell's Mrs. Johnson lives, nor even while I can get an Irish lady to torment me and offer the hospitality of my home to her cousins. 
After the warning bell, fifty or sixty teamsters inserted their dusty heads in buckets of water, turned their once white neck handkerchiefs inside out, producing a sudden effect of clean linen, and made use of the two mournful wrecks of combs which hung on strings at either side of the cobble's mirror. Many went to the bar and partook of a dust cutter. There was then such clearing of throats and such loud and prolonged blowing of noses as may not often be heard upon this globe. In the calm which ensued, conversation sprung up on lead harness, the stocked in wagon that had went off the grade, with here and there a sentiment called out by two framed lithographic bells, who in great richness of color and scantiness of raiment flanked the bar mirror. That, a dazzling reflector, chiefly destined to portray the barkeeper's back hair, which work of art involved much affectionate labor. A second bell and rolling away of doors revealed a long dining room with three parallel tables, cleanly set and watched over by Chinamen, whose fresh white clothes and bright olive buff skin made a contrast of color which was always chief among my yearnings for the Nile. While I loitered in the background, every seat was taken, and I found myself with a few dilatory teamsters destined to await a second table. The dining room communicated with the kitchen beyond by means of two square apertures cut in the partition wall. Through these portholes a glare of red light poured, except when the square framed a Chinese cook's head or discharged hundreds of little dishes. The teamsters sat down in patience. A few of the more elegant sort cleaned their nails with the three tine forks, others picked their teeth with them, and nearly all speared with this implement small specimens from the dishes before them, securing a pickle or a square inch of pie or even that luxury, a dried apple. A few on tilted back chairs drummed upon the bottom of their plates the latest tune of the road. When fairly underway, the scene became active and animated beyond belief. Waiters balancing upon their arms, twenty or thirty plates hurried along and shot them dexterously over the teamsters' heads with crash and spatter, beans swimming in fat, meats slimed with pale, ropey gravy, and over everything a faint Mongol odor. Sharks and wolves may no longer be figured as types of prandial haste. My friends, the Teamsters, stuffed and swallowed with a rapidity which was alarming, but for the dexterity they showed, and which could only have come of long practice. In fifteen minutes the room was empty, and those fellows who were not feeding grain to their mules lighted cigars and lingered around the bar. Just then my artist rushed in, seized me by the arm, and said in my ear, We'll have our supper over to Mrs. Copple's. Oh, I guess not, Sarah Jane. Arms peeled, cooking up stuff. Old woman got into the milk room with the skimmer. Hmm? He then added that if I wanted to see what I had been spared, I might follow him. We went round an angle of the building and came upon a high bank where, through wide open windows, I could look into the Chinese kitchen. By this time the second table of teamsters were under way, and the waiters yelled their orders through to the three cooks. This large unpainted kitchen was lighted up by kerosene lamps. Through clouds of smoke and steam, dodged and sprang the cooks, dripping with perspiration and grease, grabbing a stake in the hand and slapping it down on the gridiron, slipping and sliding around on the damp floor, dropping a cart of biscuits and picking them up again in their fists, which were garnished by the whole bill of fare. The red papers with Chinese inscriptions and little joss sticks here and there pasted upon each wall, the spry devils themselves and that faint sickening odor of China which pervaded the room, combined to produce a sense of deep sober gratitude that I had not risked their fare. 
Now, demanded Smith, you see that there little white building yonder? I did. He struck a contemplative position, leaned against the house, extending one hand after the manner of the minstrel sentimentalist, and softly chanted, "'Tis, so tis the cottage of me love, and there's where they're getting up as nice a little supper as can be found on this road or any other. Let's go over." So we strolled across an open space where there were two giant pines towering somber against the twilight, a little mountain brooklet, and a few quiet cows. Stop, said Smith, leaning his back against a pine, and encircling my neck affectionately with an arm. I told you, as regards Sarah Jane, how my feelings stand. Well, now, you just bet she's on the reciprocate. When I told old woman Cobbles I'd like to invite you over, Sarah Jane, she passed me in the doorway, and said she, glad to see your friends. Then, sotto voce, for we were very near, he sang again, Tis, so tis the cottage of me love. And, C.K., he continued familiarly, you're a judge of women. Chucking his knuckles into my ribs, whereat I jumped, and then he added, Ha, ah, there, I knew you was. Well, Sarah Jane is a dern magnificent female. Number three boot, just the right height for me. Venus de Copples, I call her, and would make the most touching artist wife on this planet. If I designed to paint a head, or a foot, or an arm, get my little old Sarah Jane to peel the particular charm and just whack her in on the canvas. We passed in through low doors, turned from a small dark entry into the family sitting room, and were alone there in presence of a cheery log fire, which good-naturedly bade us welcome, crackling freely and tossing its sparks out upon the floor of pine and coyote-skin rug. A few old framed prints hung upon dark walls, their faces looking serenely down upon the scanty, old-fashioned furniture and windows full of flowering plants. A low cushioned chair, not long since vacated, was drawn close by the center table, whereon were a lamp and a large open Bible with a pair of silver-bowed spectacles lying upon its lighted page. Smith made a gesture of silence toward the door, touched the Bible and whispered, Here's where old woman Copple lives, and it's a good thing. I read it aloud to her evenings, and I can just feel the high local lights of it. It'll fetch H.G. yet. At this juncture, the door opened. A pale, thin, elderly woman entered, and with tired smile greeted me. While her hard, labor-stiffened, needle-roughened hand was in mine, I looked into her face and felt something, it may be, it must be but little, yet something, of the sorrow of her life, that of a woman large in sympathy, deep in faith, eternal in constancy, thrown away on a rough, worthless fellow. All things she hoped for had failed her. The tenderness which never came, the hopes, years ago in ashes, the whole world of her yearnings, long buried, leaving only the duty of living and the hope of heaven. As she sat down, took up her spectacles and knitting, and closed the Bible, she began pleasantly to talk to us of the warm, bright autumn nights, of Smith's work, and then of my own profession, and of her niece, Sarah Jane. Her genuinely sweet spirit and natively gentle manner were very beautiful and far overbalanced all traces of rustic birth and mountain life. Oh, that unquenchable Christian fire, how pure the gold of its result. It needs no practiced elegance, no social greatness for its success. Only the warm human heart and out of it shall come a sacred calm and gentleness such as no power, no wealth, no culture may ever hope to win. 
no words of mine would outline the beauty of that plain, weary old woman, the sad, sweet patience of those gray eyes, nor the spirit of overflowing goodness which cheered and enlivened the half hour we spent there. H. G. might perhaps be pardoned for showing an alacrity when the door again opened and Sarah Jane rolled, I might almost say trundled, in, and was introduced to me. Sarah Jane was an essentially Californian product, as much so as one of those vast potatoes or massive pears. She had a suggestion of state fair in the fullness of her physique, yet withal was pretty and modest. If I could have rid myself of a fear that her buttons might sooner or later burst off and go singing by my ear, I think I might have felt as H.G. did, that she was a magnificent female, with her smooth, brilliant skin and ropes of soft brown hair. H.G., in the presence of the ladies, lost something of his original flavor and rose into studied elegance, greatly to the comfort of Sarah, whose glow of pride as his talk ran on came without show of restraint. The supper was delicious. But Sarah was quiet, quiet to H.G. and to me, until after tea, when the old lady said, You young folks will have to excuse me this evening, and withdrew to her chamber. More logs were then piled on the sitting-room hearth, and we three gathered in semicircle. Presently H.G. took the poker and twisted it about among coals and ashes, prying up the oak sticks, as he announced in a measured, steady way, An artist's wife, that is, he explained. An academician's wife, order. Well, she order sabe the beautiful, and take her regular aesthetics. And then again, he continued in explanatory tone, she ought to know how to keep a hotel, durned if she hadn't, for it's rough like first off, for a feller gets his name up. But then, when he does, though, she's got a salubrious old time of it. It's touch a little bell. He pressed the andiron top to show us how the thing was done. And, Brooks, the morning paper. You'd open your regular herald. Art notes. Another of H.G. Smith's tender works entitled Off the Grade, so full of outdoors and subtle feeling of nature, is now on exhibition at Group Hells. Look down a little further. Italian opera. Between the acts, all eyes turned to the distingue Mrs. H.G. Smith, who looked, then turning to me and waving his hand at Sarah Jane. I leave it to you if she don't. Sarah Jane assumed the pleasing color of the sugar beet without seeming inwardly unhappy. It's only a question of time with H.G., continued my friend. Art is long, you know, durned long, and it may be a year before I paint my great picture, but after that, Smith works in lead harness. He used the poker freely, and more and more his flow of hopes turned a shade of sentiment to Sarah Jane, who smiled broader and broader, showing teeth of healthy whiteness. At last I withdrew and sought my room, which was H.G.'s also, in his studio. I had gone with a candle around the walls, whereon were tacked studies and sketches, finding here and there a bit of real merit among the profusion of trash, when the door burst open and my friend entered, kicked off his boots and trousers, and walked up and down in a sort of quadrille step, singing, Yes, tis the cottage of me love, you bet, it's the cottage of me love. And what's more, H.G. has just had his genteel goodnight kiss, and when and where is the old barkeep? I checked his exuberance at best I might, knowing full well that the quiet and elegant dispenser of neat and mixed beverages, hearing this inquiry, 
would put in an appearance in person and offer a few remarks designed to provoke ill feeling. So I at last got Smith in bed and the lamp out. All was quiet for a few moments, and when I had almost gotten to sleep, I heard my roommate in low tones say to himself, Married by the Rev. Gospel, our talented California artist, Mr. H. G. Smith, to Miss Sarah Jane Copples. No cards. A pause, and then with more gentle utterance. And that's what's the matter with H. G. Slowly from this atmosphere of art, I passed away into the tranquil land of dreams. End of chapter 10 Cut off Copples